I have to say that um, thank you so much for having me here. And I'm so excited um, to share my work in progress or thinking in progress. So I have to really say that it's not it's not fixed yet. So I'm developing. And every time I have a chance to grab my colleague, I'm talking about it. But every time it's slightly changed. So I don't know how it will go today. But it will be lovely to have a little conversation on some of the concepts that I've been trying to play around to use for my own research here. So yeah, I have a fancy title here. But it's better to just talk about myself a little bit. Um, so before talking about anything about AI or education, I do believe that I am still Foucaultian. Um, and this is the kind of worldview that I'm living with. So what I believe is that everywhere, especially in all the social institutions like education and school universities, there is always power, whether we're aware of it or not. However, because of their power, they're always the counter power, try to resist also, but the resistance is often, unfortunately, within the limit of power. So how much we can resist and in which way we can resist, actually it's often programmed based on the power relationship we're staying in. So this is what I believe in terms of um, how um, university or school, all the society works. And then having said that, that I've been currently as an educational researcher, particularly interested in um, how to make education more accessible to the people who are not necessarily have the access to the education that um, other people may have, like ourselves included. Um, so I'm juggling that um, within that mission of being a critical education researcher. At the moment, I'm, I'm having a very difficult time. Um, because I don't want to be critical without being hopeful, and I don't want to be pessimistic. But be because of the worldview I'm having, following Foucauldian understanding of the power and resistance or limitation of resistance within the power system, I find it extremely difficult to be hopeful without being critical. Um, and then I feel a bit uncomfortable when people are too hopeful without being very critical. And to me, that's naive. And this is where I am currently. I, I have to say that I just got out of my early career because I got the grant, which is saying that I'm a middle career person, <laughs> which I don't really feel like it. Um, but at this moment that I'm looking back, um, mainly because of my physical relocation, I used to be in Lancaster in UK and I moved to the Seoul National University back in Korea after 12 years or 13 more than decades of living abroad and uh, facing the Korean system, which is very different from how I remembered and trying to juggle that um, in terms of making my own narratives and understanding of what the education should look like here, but at the same time, um, try not to be too pessimistic. And also being aware of the, a lot of people coming to me with very naive perspectives, which make me quite uncomfortable. Um, so that's, who I am right now. So I tend to have this slide usually up, especially for Korean audience, because um, I'm very new to Korean society or academia in South Korea. So I kind of ha I've developed this habit that I try to tell people that what is my philosophy and how I see the uh, technology. Um, so I'm taking this perspective of technology and society uh, following Foucauldian understanding as well, but um, if you like, more comfortable terminology can be social constructivism. So what I can see in terms of technology doing uh, and making relationship with society, I feel like the relationship is very dynamic um, and nothing is neutral as we can expect. And the power relationship already existing always control the how technology is invited or implemented in um, so, uh, the society. That's what I believe. And so role of technology, unfortunately, from my critical perspective, role of technology has been always very pessimist and very depressing. For me, technology has been always used to reproduce the um, unequal social relationship. 
despite the promises, usually made the opposite. So a lot of this technology, as I can, I will go through during this presentation that always made very fancy promises about openness and educational equity. However, if you look at and look back, actually what technology has been doing is nothing really, it hasn't really changed the educational system and the power structure already embedded in the system. Rather than that, it makes situation rather worse and make the um, um, inequal power relationship more stronger and worse. And that's pretty uh, sad news, especially for all of us who are interested in this, uh, how we can make education more open to the people that we care. Um, so for me, my scholarship has been always, um, kind of purpose of my scholarship has been always looking at the hidden injustice. So because of technology, always pretending it's like something very nice. And I try to really find um, the what's hidden. So what is unsaid. So how technology is used um, very differently from what is said that it had, will be used or it is used. So that's my agenda. And I find it very angry. I find myself very um, upset when I see people being to uncritically hopeful about use of technology. And obviously at this very moment of our history that we are facing very different narratives about the where word is going. So there are a lot of you know emerging narratives and it has been around probably it's even worse as since COVID about like everything is crisis. Education has been always, you know, a crisis of education has been always there for, I don't know, last, century at least, but at this moment that the crisis of the entire world and the entire human population even, that's what we are living our daily life through that discourse. But at the same time, it's a counteract, as I explained um, uh, from Foucaultian sense that because there is the crisis, there is always conflicting discourse. And then our community, probably we are one of them and really trying to create this new and counter um, discourses um, uh, going around the hope, how we can make hopeful a better future. So that's where I think our kind of community is setting. I think it's similar kind of idea that I think that I am trying to keep the balance between two. Um, so since those uh, narratives uh, are existing, I think what's happening right now is all this um, especially in terms of the emergency of new technology, which simply we can call the um, generative AI. I, I think we had this mentality. Um, I think our community, probably not so much, but uh, expand, expanded community that uh, used the technology for educational purpose. I think we have this mindset like more serious than uh, before that we can figure out, we can fix, let's change and let's see what this AI can do to make the educational problem solved. I think that's where we are right now. And uh, actually it's not really us talking about it, um, but I think there, is, has, there has been really very carefully coined and well done scholarly approaches or um, not necessarily academic all the time, but uh, as you can see a few books here actually talking about, and they're very wary about this, what I introduced about talk of innovation, often attached to these new technologies and then what it means to be tech innovation and some of the limitation and possibility always argued that has been pointed out by previous scholars. Um, and then there is huge kind of eager among us to imagine or speculate better future. And um, often it's called the, a collective imagination. Um, and then people try to, uh, go away from the pessimistic view about educational future, but um, trying to embrace uh, better, more positive possibilities. And I really appreciate this type of work and myself has been really trying to um, use this approach to reimagine the education and try to navigate the dilemma that I've been having for a while. Um, but conclusion first, I find it a bit difficult even uh, being supported by this kind of idea and wonderful colleagues uh, giving me some great methodological approaches, but still I find it always very difficult to <laughs> be too positive and imagining a positive future itself, I find it um, a little bit naive. So that's where we are. 
and uh, where I am right now. And definitely there is the differences for me. It's important for us to make it clear. And often, uh, currently I've been worried about this imagination, uh, kind of use this term almost interchangeably uh, with the speculation. And for me, imagination and speculation are very different. And this is the Oxford Dictionary, the definition. But there is this two, I think that, I believe that these two things shouldn't be mixed up. And I think we can imagine the better future and that imagination is coming from very new idea, which is not at all the presence to the sense. So the things that we haven't seen, we haven't been able to even imagine before, but that we kind of wanted to collectively draw just new picture of the future. I think that's imagination. And speculation for me is very different because speculation is always grounded in what is here right now, the past and presence and what we have in front of us, the things that we have been sensed, we have been uh, playing around experience. I think based on that, we can speculate. So the difference between the two is speculation is not necessarily a whole new word that we can just imagine. Speculation for me is very uh, much kind of based on the possibility that we imagine. Um, so from Foucauldian sense, the probably what we can do at our best is speculation rather than imagination because our imagination whatsoever is always uh, conditions and structured within what is already there and uh, existing structure. And the power relationship that we are living with without being even conscious of, I think that will always make us the choice that um, the limited choice that what we can go further and not. So I think going back to uh, what I felt about the the current um, effort in our field, I really appreciate. It. I'm happy to be part of it, but often I'm not really sure that some of the writing that we have produced are uh, talking about education future, kind of really radically innovative way, whether I, I can't really see the implication of that, whether to how to which extent that actually that kind of imagination beyond speculation will have some bearing in our actual life beyond our community, uh, us being celebratory with our collective imagination. So, so that's why I don't want to talk about imagination that much, although I had imagination in my title, but I wanted to make clear that this presentation and what I try really do at the moment is speculating the future. And it's not necessarily something very new from the current work. I think my speculation is probably based on, I don't know, it's probably old version of imagination in, if you like, it's probably based on even movies. And some of the problems that I've been experiencing and thinking of for the past, you know, uh, 16 or 17 years of my academic career. So speculation, it has always happened. I mean, it's not like now it comes to our academia and I like it because it free us. So as a, a quality researcher, I really welcome this approach that we can speculate based on not the form a form evidence so we don't have form evidence about what's uh, what the technology is going to do to our education system but based on our understanding historical development of society and education in the past we can speculate and then uh, from my perspective that we have seen a lot of speculation pretty much very well done speculation from movies that actually we're now seeing it. So as you can see, the AI is like movie from 2002, more than 20, uh, 20 years ago. But I think this is something we're about to see in terms of what the virtual reality or this um, artificial intelligence can do to enhance some of the you know, human capacity. And uh, Another movie that I'm pretty sure that all of us know, and then this is speculation. Um, I don't know whether it's positive speculation or negative speculation. I, I remember kind of feeling quite sad after watching this, but this is what is happening right now, so no doubt. And then there is a bit more dangerous and more um, 
So some of the ethical concerns that we are having right now, um, AI, whether human, we will have control over AI or AI is going to eventually control our thought and behavior thinking. So we have this kind of ethical dilemma right now. And then we have seen that from very, you know, one of those, the movies around, the, you know, in new millennium period. And obviously, yeah, we, you know, this movie that, at the end of the day, we don't maybe have to worry about anything because tomorrow I think world will shut down. So, but anyway, so still going on. So I think it's meaningful to have this conversation. So speculation in education from researchers' perspective, just in case some of you haven't really come across this idea, I just wanted to introduce very briefly. Um, but speculation approach is like speculate speculative method. It has been used uh, in the field. And then I think one of the uh, seminar work done by Jen Ross uh, in 2017, and she has a book that I also showed you at the beginning. So this speculation, as I mentioned, it's different from um, imagination because as you can see on the screen, it's something about what is not existing right now, but it's not going to be new in terms of never happenedness. So we are not going to imagine the word that will never happen, but we are still imagining the word, but it can be happening based on what we understand, uh, how the word has been progressed, but it's just not yet happened. So I think for me, that not yet happenedness or a not yetness and not never happenedness. I think those are important um, def, 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 uh, impact, impact the division between imagination and speculation too. So she has um, just then suggested a several uh, methodological approach that we can take uh, to free ourselves to imagine the or speculate the education future in this paper. So if you haven't had a chance, you can uh, have a look and using the following uh, such uh, methodological approach there has been um, papers so this paper I think some of the you from the community have also participated uh, alongside um, other I don't know I mean I'm one of them but I wouldn't really see myself as ex expert so I don't know how to say it but a bunch of people who care about education kind of wrote the stories together and then we kind of analyze those stories together to think about the education future driven by AI in very diverse, dif diversely different ways. So this is kind of typical example that you can come across. So no matter what, of, um, I think that speculation is happening all the time or imagination. And I think what I see that are coming with AI right now, especially in the field of more marketized field of ad tech studies and research. What I see is that AI as a discourse, it has been bringing a lot of imagination of educational future that I think for me, I really doubt that that will happen actually. So I think a lot of discourses about the power of AI for education and then educate, what educate, AI can bring to education. I think for me, that has been I would say that I will ca categorize them as imagination rather than speculation. And those imagination for me is very uh, is very problematic, as you can see. So um, I have this slide briefly go if I briefly go through that this is one of the examples that what um, imagination can look like in the policy context of South Korea. So this is the vision of the education that South Korea government or Ministry of Education will try to bring to all the schools. Um, and as you can see that it's a vision of the using technology. So this is the document about what we can do use um, use AI for education. So Korean government, they imagine very humanistic and futuristic, beautiful future with AI. And they want everyone and students to be emotional creators and then humor center, very human centered thinking that they want to uh, radically change the curriculum. And rather than them changing it, they do somehow believe that using AI will change it by introducing this idea hyper personalized learning environment. By doing so, they really believe that the everything will be inclusive. So the openness that we've been really working hard for the past many, many decades in our community, that they think that AI, by you providing the hyper-personalized learning environment to every single student, that the education will be inclusive and open. So that's what they have as their vision. 
And the whole idea is high tech and high touch, which means that it's very emotional as well. So education is going to be for all. Um, so basic idea how education will look like is so currently that there is the uh, direct meditation, direct connection between teacher and students, but they think that now teacher and student, their interaction will be all mediated by technology. And then what the whole idea of this policy is AI digital textbook. Um, I don't want to go through it um, too much de in too much detail, but the idea is that it's important because we're going to do personalized classroom um, and then students can learn according to their abilities. And I'm going to go through very uh, related to uh, how Korean system is in terms of education, that we are very competitive and we're um, very outcome oriented, exam oriented um, culture here that we are having for schools. But uh, by using AI as a textbook, they think that the entire schooling system can be changed because students can learn according to their own ability and pace. And teacher can just provide guidance to, indi to individual because that data is going to be uh, uh, available about each students. And then teachers, rather than telling students or teaching students knowledge, they believe that teachers can give the counseling and parents can also do educate their children better based on very objective information about them. So yeah, in the other presentation, I tend to kind of critically analyze this text uh, in terms of more linguistically or discursive way, but I will just jump to share that, um, share the idea that uh, what's imagined um, in Korean society right now. So this is going to be for example of the teacher's screen and teacher's uh, dashboard that all this information about the students in with students emotion and their uh, physio physio um, reaction to the task will be all recorded and then teacher can give you know accordingly the guidance to students but anyway but as you can see that this is not very new, this kind of promises about the personalized learning and closing that gap between and education for all. I think it has been around. Um, so open education and the MOOCs, uh, OER and many of us have involved in actually making them. And we've been like, we've been like working really hard with um, uh, striving to open the education by doing a lot of things uh, with non-AI technologies. Um, and there are many, many conversations about and discourses about what like this open uh, education resource can do to close the gap. Unfortunately, as we saw during the COVID, especially that uh, after all these years of work, that education was still very inaccessible to many people. And um, at the global scale, it's, was, it's very still unequal. But even at the local and within the classroom setting, we saw that there is differences among students in terms of their conditions for learning. So my question is like, we have been going through all of these hypes and all this imaginations which never happened. So it's like we kind of experience never happenness of all these discourses of the technology. And my question is why we're still believing that this new technology has been it's going to do something very different. So some people are really clear that their AI is very different from the online because it has machine learning and it's, it's learning by themselves. It's like developing self very fast. And so AI is not the simple technology. It's very different. And some people are really trying to give huge agency to AI. But I'm not only sure because it's not the you know, it's not the first year that, I mean, we've been like, especially the last 10 years that we've been having great books that I'm um, that we've been reading that how technology, all the promises were false, but we still believe that that's has it's it's what it is. Uh, we still believe that technology will help us, and I think this kind of idea that the uh, almost the progress of the consciousness of freedom is almost Hegelian understanding of the how society develops. So Hegel argued that uh, he he or believes that the technology um, the society will develop and human will be liberated and free um, as our consciousness is developing. And this whole idea of technology comes in and technological development will lead to social development. And if social society develops and then human is going to be liberated, this kind of argument that we've been seeing a lot previously. Uh, and then we saw this argumentations, but we also experienced that human liberation wasn't really happened. 
So this understanding of technological deterministic kind of drive or the idea of solution, uh, technology as solution, and this a plus little bit of technology is somehow neutral. So we, if we use technology with our intention, good intention to change the world for good, and then somehow world is going to be a better place for hum human. Uh, yeah, and then believe that, honestly, that if the world has been so much better place for a certain human but it's not for everyone, as we know. So this kind of idea is still very prevailing, um, unfortunately, in our just normal thinking, taken for granted kind of conversation we're usually having. I think it's based on the Hegelian perspective. And I don't believe that we have been liberated. So that's where I've been working on in terms of making this methodological approach slightly more I don't know, advanced. And I have to say again that I haven't been so successful. I've been like playing with different ideas. So I still love this idea of speculative method, but I think just speculation, kind of doing speculation in line with the imagination without like really deeply engaging with the current uh, limited possibility that we're leaving. Um, I think it's not really helpful because all the speculation, we have been doing it, but it's, it never happened. So for me, I think this is my kind of work in progress that I've tried to develop this idea of we can do speculative method, but kind of employing some of the theory um, or some of the methodological approach that Marx, Karl Marx has used himself uh, as like somehow we can, um, uh, it's, maybe we can call it like materialistic, dialectic or dialectical materialism, so whichever you like. And I try to incorporate this to and see what kind of future can be imagined that we, we take this approach rather than just imagining and collectively imagining and being just hopeful. I don't think that being hopeful is that hopeful anymore. So I don't want to go through, I don't want to go through the Marxist understanding, a Marxist approach to into detail. I mean, if you have questions, I can answer it. But I have to say I'm not Marxist myself. I'm, I'm currently learning myself with my students here. A basic idea in terms of how uh, the Marx sees the word is very, the word, how word changed is very different from Hegelian. So almost the Hegelian way of thinking, as you imagine, if you know that this is a very Hegelian logic of human consciousness and our, you know, our, as I mentioned that he, he, our consciousness developed through this kind of um, dialectical um, process of thesis, proposition, and then antithesis, and then together that will make something slightly new and then experience contradictions and that would develop our consciousness. And then because of our consciousness developed and then society can be developed and then human can be liberated over time. So that kind of understanding, that's what, what Marx, although Marx started with, he was born as Hegelian, but he kind of left Hegel because he doesn't believe this. So for Marx, it's not that simple. The word is not changing that in our brain at all. So for Marx, word has word is changed and society developed um, all kind of much more negatively. Or if you like, the capitalism emerged and developed and then expanded. And then the logic is not like us think, sitting down and thinking what's right and wrong. It's more like a very, very uh, messy, dialectical and materialistic experience and relationship that uh, we kind of leave it. And then this materialistic kind of conditions that changed and created contradictions, but they, it's not like the beautiful triangle. It's more like very messy, circular kind of relationship we experience. So if you uh, haven't kind of read it, I kind of suggested this book, which I find it very useful to bring some tools to, uh, to analyze like Marx. Um, so it's um, so there is a few steps that Mark and the uh, Professor Oldman try to kind of unpack Marxist dialect, Marxist, Marxist dialectical model. And uh, this is idea here. The whole point here is that the quantity, we have to have enough accumulated quantity change 
to change the word in a very qualitative way. So actually change the word, changing word, changing the word is not that simple. It's not like just a group of people imagine the better education and somehow use one tool. And as you can, as you can, um, you know that uh, the machine or technology for Marx is always on the side of capitalist and then it has never been helping the working class so this idea makes actually our speculation a little bit more careful in my view and then understanding the past and the conditions that we're living is a key to uh, make the speculation that can be actually um, useful enough for us to have, uh, have some implication for the education system. So if I try to put this kind of very condition or conditional contextual or material condition oriented uh, analysis of the presence and then trying to speculate the future with education future with uh, AI, unfortunately, I can't be very hopeful. That's the problem that I'm debating right now, uh, because just Briefly, Korea is such an odd country, especially I will, from here, I will, art, um, I will uh, contextualize my conversation within the Korean setting. Korea is a lovely country. Um, I want everyone to come, but a, we are very, very competitive uh, and among some of the Asian countries that we are, I mean, we are one of the top being very competitive in terms of education especially education is all about going to the best university. Um, and like there is number one, two, three, four, five, uh, set in stone that, that will never change um, ever since they started. Um, so it's almost like this, it's the image of laundry and the shop. So, the, you know, laundry shop that um, in the very poor area in South Korea, and then usually someone is lending out this small kind of unit of the uh, apartment block and or a, the, the market area and do laundry in South Korea. That That's really typical kind of symbolic um, identification of working class. But this lady who is owning this laundry shop, she doesn't really believe she's working class although she doesn't have to she doesn't have money to support herself even her daily she's always worried about the business collapsed and she's like she's not very stable but she's like i'm middle class or she's always very confident the re reason being um for her to believe that she's not working class is because her son I mean, usually I ask questions, but I'll just probably go and then give you an answer. Her son, only son that she was very proud of, she's very proud of, goes to Seoul National University where I'm teaching. It's like best university in South Korea. And her son going to that university itself, it hasn't changed anything about her material condition or her class system in terms of her social economical uh, status. However, she feels like she truly believes she's a middle class. And even going beyond that, she believes that she's joining the elite class. So, I mean, obviously things have been changed. This study has been done like decades ago, but we have this kind of culture. So I'm just kind of introducing this to give you the sense of how competitive it means, how, how crazy people are in terms of going to the best university. And then um, we have the saying that um, the, where at, the, at this moment, her case is almost a miracle. It will never happen because we have the saying that uh, as long as you're born, actually, you know which university you will go. That's the current situation in South Korea that um, going to top university is just symbolically or culturally very expensive. Um, because we spend a lot of money in private education to make that happen. And all these two-year-old boys and girls, they go to typical um, kindergarten that is like as a starting point to make that journey to the top university in South Korea. That's where I live. And then as I told you, that it's all about education um, and degree of the uh, university degree that we are fighting. And then how you go to your next university, obviously a series of exams so it's exams start from age two again so going to the kindergarten at age two I don't know how that happened but you have to take exam I mean two-year-old boy should take exam to get into the kindergarten that you know I mean it's a lot of nonsense here but um and then everything is all kind of recorded and so that means that everyone the students they are all classified in terms of their ranking 
um, starting from very early age. And then there is no physical kind of punishment or anything, but entire education system is very, it's almost like panopticon from Foucauldian sense that every single kind of little exam or test recorded and contributed to your future in South Korea. So it's even more scary than just being punished physically. And now this ADHD, the medicine is like, huge boom in South Korea. Um, I mean, it's boom around the world in South Korea. It's more serious because parents are willingly and they're actively seeking this medication for their children to come down and study. So this is where, this is material condition South Korea education system is built on. And the power relationship in terms of the educational differences and economical differences is like very clear. It's almost scary and i did not i don't remember my my area uh, my i mean i grown i i have grown up here but it wasn't like that 20 or 30 years ago but anyway now this is condition that we have and imagining this future in terms of giving students and hyper personalized learning environment and education opportunity and then imagine that that will somehow create the democratic society that education is going to be all for everyone and just happy, happy kind of imagination that like I, I see very strongly in all this attack discourses and policies and actually policy uh, in terms of it's very powerful in terms of a lot of budget goes into the policy. Actually, we are developing the, the textbook. And text to be will be circulated and available made available to all schools by next year. It's a fast moving. And I find it very difficult to believe that um, this is happening here. So for me, if I try to be speculate based on the con emotional material condition or power relationship that was uh, set in stone in this country, seriously. I can't, that's my, not. this is not my imagination. I can't imagine future in this democratic way. So my imagination has been very, very negative and pessimistic, um, although I didn't want to, but I had to do. So for me, I was, I'm very scared of this idea that um, entire schooling in terms of the giving data to students, to uh, giving data of student to teacher, actually it's gonna be even more very classified system of the student's behavior. Now students should take the exam, at least the exam is something based on students' awareness and um, uh, consciousness. They, they agreed to take the exam and then the exam score are recorded uh, contributing to their university path. But now the system is going to be um, the digital textbook will track their eye move, eyeball movement even. I don't know what that means, but it's like almost everything without students being conscious of um, is going to be monitored and measured and recorded. And then that will all contribute to classification of um, students in terms of their rank. So having said that, that liberation of human based on the development of technology, certainly I can't see that here. And then what it means to teachers in terms of, you know, giving all this, I, I show you that dashboard. So all these education tech, uh, ad tech companies are actually competing right now. And then uh, to win the competition, they're trying to make more features and more data. So the dashboard that you know, all these ad tech companies are bringing in, are very complex um, and I can't really understand that how teachers can read and react based on it's almost instant kind of reaction they want teachers to do so I don't think the teacher can it's not ability it's not the capability issue I think it's not just important as human and that what means that if the human can't do it is AI gonna give them um, guidance for their guidance to each individual students. And then the problem with that kind of system is that teachers wouldn't really have the autonomy in terms of their own work and judgment and professionalism of teacher. I very doubt that how we can um, afford that within this sort of data-driven system. And uh, currently we have a lot of problem because education is such a huge big deal for um, parents, especially because everything, what teacher, uh, what teacher simply uh, writing in their school report has like critical, it, it, like it, within this competition, 
that teacher's one remark can be critical. So if teachers say one negative thing, a parents will, you know, they will dash into school and ask teacher to change their opinion of their children because that will ruin their children's future. So I'm not exaggerating. That's happening. There is an issue of distrust here. And if this is the system and teacher can't say anything unless the data is going to back them up, of course, it can work for teacher's sake, but I think the other, other um, for me, well, I don't know. A, um, so for me, it's going to really, le really lead the isolation of teacher, isolated of students, and then they are, all the students and teacher, they're going to be there, not as a human, but they're going to be there as very isolated object that almost, for me, the control by the data that they are supposed to help them to be human or humanistic. And the whole idea of this competition, um, so this AI is not neutral, as we know. All this data, that algorithm that our AI is using, is pretty much embedded in the what the socially valued at the moment. In South Korea, competition and being fast and being the top within the limited time of 18 years of their life, who is going to get further will lead them to um, the top schools. And then within this algorithm or within this logic of the society, actually nothing will be, if this isn't going to change, and then entire AI personalized education system will just make someone faster. Um, and someone faster, and we just give the um, kind of double message, the, the, the kind of opposite message to certain students being slow, and then we can tell them it's okay for you to be slow, and because this is ultimately very personal learning experience, there is nothing, just do your study at your pace, but at the end of the day, it's not very ethical because those students will be totally I mean, of course, education and uh, university is not everyone's pers uh, everyone's goal in South Korea. But I have say I have to say, eighty five percent students in South Korea go to university. So within this context, that yeah, being fast and someone can be faster because of the aid of AI will make this gap between students even bigger, rather than make everything much more that a uh, inclusive. So I think for me, my future that I can speculate based on my understanding of current material condition of South Korea, unfortunately, it's going to be an even bigger inequality issue. And the gap between class or gender or anything can be eventually bigger. And education is not going to be that beautiful. So for me, so I still want this type of future to become, to come. But whenever I talk about this future, very depressing future, a lot of people are coming to me and saying that, oh, well, you're doing criticism for sake of criticism, that uh, you can't just criticize things without having alternatives. So for me, I don't have alternative because <laughs> I think the education has a lot of problem. That's why we're trying to fix it. But I think it's not educational problem that we have to fix it. For me, it's like so social problem or cultural problem is a bigger problem within context. Education is reproducing that. So just fixing education or the method that we how we teach would only make this education system that we wanted to imagine. So it's good to collectively imagine for hope and good for being hopeful and good for you know, being positive. However, for me, it's important for us to speculate the future more accurately, more realistically, based on what we have right now. And then that can be only starting point that we can think about rather than just go with the flow being hopeful. Thank you.